The 2018 midterm elections will be remembered for a long time. A record number of people voting, long lines at many locations and broken ballot boxes making the lines even longer. My guest to discuss what all this means is election attorney Howard Grobart. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> And I got it right. Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Let's begin by talking about these changes in Albany. Well, in one way, I think uh, Democrats are very happy. But in another way, I really wonder if the Democrats in Albany are all that happy. Certainly the ones in the state Senate are. But there's a price that comes when you control the Senate and the Assembly and the governorship. And that price is accountability. You can no longer say, I want to do all these wonderful things. We've tried to do all these wonderful things, but we're blocked by those damn Senate Republicans. Now it's time to put up or shut up. And it remains to be seen whether they're going to live up to that challenge. So let's talk about the change, the change of Democrats and the change of, on the Republican side. Well, Democrats picked up, what is it, like eight seats in the state Senate. They have a margin that is as wide as any I think I've seen since I've been living in New York State. 17 seat margin. Simka Felder, who had the Senate in the palm of his hands and made it bend to his whim because he could pick either side and make them the majority, now is in irrelevancy. Uh, and all of a sudden, the Republican Party, which always had a big piece of the action in Albany, whether there was a Republican governor or not, uh, now has been marginalized. And the margin is so big that there is going to be no surprise coups or anything like that. No Amigos, no IDC, no one who is going to be able to, the Democrats have enough margin, they can let people off the hook on a vote that's uncomfortable for them. And that's going to give them the responsibility of being accountable. You uh, talked about accountable, accountability earlier. Ex explain that. Well, when you no longer can just pass one house bills and say we passed this, this and that, but it got blocked by the Senate, people are going to expect you to come forward on things that you say you are for, that I am dubious people r really are for. Uh, Why are you for dubious? instance, yeah. Uh, yeah. election reform. A lot of people have uh, a lot at stake in the status quo. And whether we're going to have real meaningful election reform, uh, whether we're going to have a single payer health insurance system in New York, I think remains to be seen. It's very easy to pass one house bills. When those one house bills get a consensus in both houses, they often have to go and totally rewrite them because no one cares what's in a one house bill. <laughs> you know, when it's actually going to become law, you have to get serious. And now the Democratic Party in New York State is going to have to be serious and put up or shut up on so many issues where they've made so many promises to people and said, if only we had a majority in the Senate. Well, they have a majority in the Senate, and now it's time for them to produce. Mm -hmm. And I think whether they will produce in the ways they've been talking about remains to be seen. You talked about election reform earlier. In fact, you talked about it twice. Well, there, there are all different sorts of election reforms people are talking about. Uh, no excuse absentee voting, early voting. Uh, you know, you have to jump through hoops to get an absentee ballot in New York. Uh, there's only certain reasons you can have one. I mean, people do lie. Uh, there is no early voting in New York. There, there are a lot, uh, most states have either one or the other. New York is one of the few, if any, states that has neither early voting or no excuse absentee balloting. And it discourages the process. A lot of people want to make changing enrollment. We have a terribly long time to change party enrollment. I don't necessarily think that's an awful thing that 
the people have to wait somewhat because especially in the smaller parties there there's sometimes an incentive to do a little party raiding you know republicans decide hell i'm going to participate in the democratic primary and cause trouble or you know it's happened before people try to take over the conservative party in some county and make mischief do people in brooklyn really care uh... i think people in brooklyn really care uh, for instance about the ability to change enrollment a lot of younger voters don't tend to affiliate with parties and they learned the lesson during the Bernie Sanders campaign when they went to the vote for him and showed up on primary and told they weren't enrolled Democrats and couldn't vote in the Democratic primary. Uh, it's not a majority by any means but I think a lot of people do care a lot of people think it should be easier and while there are some reasons why there is a waiting period before an, there's a time before an election before you can change mm. you know, we have an extraordinarily long period of time and there's good arguments to be made that it should be shorter and I could go on changes in the way boards of election are formed uh, but you're an election attorney, so you would know. <laughs> well, as an election attorney, I have no real incentive to tick off people at the Board of Elections who I might have to deal with from time to time. But I think everyone can think of things they would like to change about the operation of our election system in New York. Let's talk about the propositions. Well, we had There three. are so many people who never even bothered to answer this. Well, they didn't turn over their ballots, uh, but a lot of people did turn over the ballot, and the ballot was two pages, and that mm -hmm. caused some problems uh, along with wetness. But we had three propositions. Proposition one was about changes in our city campaign financing system. Uh, and I, 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 there were good things and bad things in it. Uh, I thought. I thought uh, increasing the uh, amount of money the city would match in matching funds and increasing the amount by which it compounded them was on balance a good thing. On the other hand, uh, in some ways they made it, made it more difficult for candidates. They, cap, they put a lower cap on the amount that you could raise from an individual donor in order to be eligible for matching funds. And the problem is the people who have the ability to raise larger money that's permissible under state law and opt out are going to be able to raise that money mm -hmm. nonetheless. And it's, it's going to make candidates spend more time on the phone talking to more people to raise that money. And I'm not necessarily sure, even with the good things here, uh, getting money to candidates earlier, which has a plus and a minus to it, and uh, and the raising of the amount this campaigns uh, will be matched, that it's it's necessarily uh, a positive. But I, I I saw arguments on both sides. We had the second proposition for civic engagement commission. I'm not sure even the people who authored it knew what that was, although it seemed to encompass a lot of functions currently done by people other than the mayor and put them basically on the control of the mayor, which looks a bit like a power grab. And the third is community board term limits, which I happen to oppose rather vehemently. I published an article on it in uh, City Limits. Uh, I th think the real impact community boards have to the extent they have it and I am a board member uh, and I'm not affected by any term limit that could come mm. uh, I, I'm a new board member after a 10-year hiatus or more than that uh, is community boards can shake the land use process and they most effectively do so when they have members who have expertise in land use and institutional memory of what's gone on before and the history of what's happened in the neighborhood. You know, developers and land use lawyers don't have term limits. And I'm not sure that we're not going to regret when these are eventually instituted what we lose. And because a majority, 
You know, my count, uh, one of the council members in my area, Brad Lander, happened to support the proposition. I said to him, Brad, why don't you just impose term limits on the people you, you, you uh, appoint? Mm -hmm. that, that he wouldn't do. Yeah. But he, I, I, I do think it makes it easier for those people who want to spur more development. I'm actually, more getting, development I'm, spur. I'm actually getting the wrap up. Um, 30 seconds, talk about the other proposition. Well, I think we did all those, three. Those, the three, I thought there was a fourth. No, there were three. Just three. I, 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 if there was, I didn't, <laughs> I kept turning the ballot, I didn't see anything You didn't else. see anyone. Okay. Well, thank you, Howard Grobard. Thank you, Sam, um, always a pleasure. Howard is an election law attorney, and in a short while you'll be meeting this week's young academic achiever, another one of Brooklyn's outstanding students, and attorney Ray Marsh will be talking to Francesca Meves about some of the many challenges young black men are facing. Coming up soon, Rudy Daly will be face to face with another Brooklyn student, this week's young academic achiever. What does it mean to be a young black man from the Caribbean living in New York? That's the discussion you're about to hear. Francesca? Thank you, Sam. Today we're going to speak with a lawyer that I believe that is bringing back a good name for lawyers. He has a pack. A he has a practice that is focusing on humanity and ethics. So let's speak with him. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> All right. Mr. Wayne Marsh. Correct. Could you introduce us? Well, um, good night, everybody. Uh, my name is Wayne, and I've been in practice in Brooklyn for the past, actually, I celebrate my third year as a solo practitioner owning my one firm on Eastern Parkway in um, Crown Heights. Mm -hmm. uh, my practice focuses primarily on immigration matters and family law. Mm. So with, as a family law and immigration, as you said, mm -hmm. so what is your typical clientele? Um, generally, I'm serving in regards to immigration law, um, the Caribbean community. Mm. Um, and that ranges from persons doing citizenship application to family-based petitions. Um, in relation to my family law practice, um, for some reason I find myself representing primarily um, single women, mm -hmm. single women. And um, there are certain unique challenges that I face or I've come across, I've seen that relates to single women mm -hmm. and particularly with black boys. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you're interacting with these single moms, I know there's like special requests that they seem to ask you or what's your relationship when you come across these kind of clients? Well, what I've seen over the past three years is that um, majority of my clients tend to be women, as I said, mm -hmm. and somehow they struggle with youths mm -hmm. in the sense that um, a father is not in the home and there's no positive role model, there's no one to really fashion and shape the development of the child. That in itself presents certain challenges where the children are concerned, the boys in particular. Um, if you walk, across, walk along Eastern Parkway, there are certain areas that you would notice that um, boys are often hanging on the streets, mm. you don't see girls. Um, and that, it's, that in itself presents a very a certain dynamics in the court, in the family courts. And um, the, the major problem, the major issue that I see is one of lack of direction. Mm. You know, these young boys or young men knowing what it means to be a man, how to uh, refuse or to claim their own identity without feeling a need to belong to certain groups um, without feeling a need to prove their manhood to anybody. That's, that's the major issue that I see. So you, you're a lawyer, but you find yourself being a counselor, maybe even a role model to your clients or your clientele. So what, what happens when you're being really honest with your clients or with your client's son? How do they receive it? Well. Um, I see myself as all my practice as one that tries to 
adhere to certain ethical principles. So for example, um, as lawyers we're into business. Mm -hmm. That is what we do. We're here to, um, in a capitalist society and we try to make money. But there's an ethical obligation as to how do we balance the need to make money mm -hmm. versus trying to present a service that reflects the interests of our clients. Mm -hmm. And so I see my role as one of being totally honest with the client, of trying to in, 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 in encourage the parties to not make an issue one of a fight, but to try and settle issues, especially in a family context. Because ultimately, um, the parties, mother, father, um, you may not like each other, but the reality is that both of you did actions or did certain actions that produce a child. So and, yeah. has there ever been a time where you've been really honest with your clients and they no longer needed your legal assistance anymore? It happens. It, it has happened. And um, whenever it happens, I'm happy hmm. because my role is not to prolong litigation. My role is to encourage parties to get along. Um, and I think it's an ethical obligation that we have to ensure that we do the best for the child that is involved in the sense that um, when parents argue, there's only, there are only two winners, oftentimes, possibly three. And those winners are the attorney who represents the mother, mm -hmm. the attorney who represents the father, and perhaps the attorney who represents the children. But the losers, and the bigger loser is often the child. Mm. The second bigger, bigger loser is uh, the mother and the father. So therefore, you want to make sure that you, you, know, you encourage these parties to, to act reasonably. Have you ever encountered a role model such as yourself. So what really motivates you to do this? Have you seen someone else do this or you just? Um, I grew up in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, at age 15, there about, my father committed suicide. Sorry, right. loss. Um, thank you. And I've had to learn to overcome that. Mm -hmm. I've had to learn to understand what it means to be a man, more or less on my own. Fortunately, however, my father had laid the groundwork mm -hmm. for my development. So at that point, I'd reached, gotten to the age where I, do not, I did not believe that I needed anybody's approval. Unfortunately, for a person who is growing up in a, or a boy who's growing up in a household where there's, and has never been a, where there's no man around and there's never been a father around, father figure around, he faces a unique challenge. And his challenge is, not having any concept, any idea as to what his role or what, how he should develop himself as a man. Many times, um, you know, strong, and we heard this term strong black women, mm -hmm. and we would think that, you know, we don't need a man. Um, I've had situations where clients have said, listen, can you please embrace my child? Can you please show him that there's somebody as a man who's not necessarily trying to get an advantage from me as a woman um, to, to let him know that he can, he can, he can open up to someone, he can um, refuse to think that he has to be on the block, to refuse to think that he has to do the things that his friends are doing in order to prove his manhood. You know, so I've, I've, had, I've definitely had those um, situations there. And um, to the extent that I can, I do. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I, kn I know for a fact what um, growing up as a Boy Scout did for me. Um, I always had um, very positive role models. Um, my father was a very positive role model for me. Unfortunately, not all of us have that mm -hmm. or ha you know, have had that blessing. So I do try to see myself not only as a person who is an attorney, but I also try to embrace boys in particular. Um, I recall being in school and I would often, especially because I studied in England, and I recall mm -hmm. being in school and noticing that um, I'm in a class. One Saturday, I remember being in, in the library at the, University of at the University of London Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Mm -hmm. 
and I counted seven male students, seven. And there were 25 women. And I said to myself, this is a crisis. Mm -hmm. Because what it means is that we are setting up a system or the reality is such that these 25 women or 20 dear about women are going to be searching for husbands somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. And if our men are not there, if our boys are not there with them, what are they going to do? So what is something that you can tell us or tell black boys today that can just keep them on the right path? It's okay not to be okay. <laughs> it is okay to admit that you're not doing well. Mm -hmm. It is okay to be vulnerable. There's nothing wrong with recognizing that, listen, um, I need somebody to guide me. I need somebody to speak to. Um, and one thing I believe that we should be telling ourselves as single parents, especially women, is that we can't do it on our own. Mm. We need peer groups. We need to be honest with ourselves and we need to find ways of engaging. Thank Learn you. It. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us. And it seems like you've you're very insightful and you're using so much of your experience to help the next generation of black boys. And it's really appreciative and it's very, very humble of you to do that. Thank so, you and thank you. We had that great interview with um, a friend and a very humane um, attorney. And thank you so much for being here. Back to you, Sam. Thank you, Francesca. We are so proud of some of Brooklyn's middle school and high school students that we invite them to tell you about their work inside and outside of the classroom. Rudy? Good evening. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by one of our young academic achievers, uh, Melvin Mason Balbuena. Melvin, welcome to Young Academic Achievers. Thank you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you go to school? I go to school at Brooklyn School for Music and Theater. And uh, what, you, what grade are you in? I'm a senior in high school. Okay. And how old are you now? I'm 16 years old. You're 16 years old and a senior in high school. That's, that's pretty awesome. I must be doing a lot of good things. Um, tell me, what kind of classes do you have at, at uh, BSMT? We have our traditional Common Core classes. So we have English, History, Sciences, Maths. And then we also have our theater or music classes, along with ballet and other dance classes. Do you do any of these classes? Do you do ballet, dance, and anything? Yes. What do you do? I'm involved in the theater class and in the ballet class, and then I take my regular common core classes as well. So you dance? Yes. All right. That's not one of my talents, but... Yeah. <laughs> um, so tell me something. So how are you doing in school? I'm doing pretty good. That's pretty good? Um, 95 GPA, 4.0. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. And you say you're a senior, right? Yes. So what do you plan to do uh, next year? Um, I plan to enroll into college um, my in January mm -hmm. so for a spring semester, and I plan on becoming a commercial marketer mm -hmm. as one of my careers. Did you say you plan to graduate in January? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. So you, you, you're looking at colleges now. What colleges are you looking at? Um, my top two choices right now are NYU, the University of Vermont, and Emerson College. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all schools that have really good media programs. Did you apply any early decision? No. No, okay. So tell me, tell me some things about what your life is like at BSMT. Um, so I get to school on time every day. <laughs> something <laughs> That's a, thing. a lot of kids struggle with sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I get there on time, I greet my professor, and I get straight to work. Then I go to my second period class and do that on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> All day. <laughs> every day until eighth period. Okay, okay. So do you do any other activity in school other than the dance and the, the academics? Um, I'm also involved in my student government association. What is that? Um, so it's SGA. We're a group of kids and staff, Mr. Daly, who um, sort of help administer the school and make sure that everything is running smoothly for staff and students. Okay. What else do you do? Do you do anything else outside of that? Um, yes. I help tutor kids because last year I got the highest um, grade on the U.S. history regions, so I helped kids with that. And I just make sure that my school is a comfortable, sp a comfortable space. 
Okay. Um, tell me about some of your interests. You, you, you spoke about dance. So do you do anything with that on the public level? Do you go out and dance? What do you? Um, besides dancing in the shower, I don't really dance much. <laughs> <laughs> but I do act. Um, that's one of my very uh -huh. important passions to me. So I act a lot on a serious level. Okay. Before when we were talking, maybe you told me you did some p some PSAs. Uh, tell me about that. What do you do PSAs on? Um, so I do public service announcements on gun reform. Mm -hmm. um, I also do them in school just to help the school. Anything that needs to be said in school, um, I say it on the speakers. Mm -hmm. Anything that anyone has questions on, they come to me and I speak to them about it. Just simple stuff like that. Okay. What You, you spoke about gun reforms. What, why is that important? Um, New York City, um, especially in the impoverished neighborhoods, gun violence is a very prominent issue. And I'm trying to find ways to sort of lower the crime rate mm -hmm. in those neighborhoods, especially the gun violence ones, because those do a lot of harm. Oh, okay, That's, that, that is excellent. Do you join any groups outside of school that relates to gun violence or any other community things that you, you um, want to share with us? Well, I'm trying to start my own group mm -hmm. and sort of take initiative there and help the community in that way. Okay, so you said you're going to college, you, you, you're very well on your way, you're 95 average and everything that goes along with that and the community thing, so you want, plan to bring some of these things to your college as well? Yes, of course. So you're looking forward to January? Yes. All right, so it was, it was great uh, talking to you here on uh, Young Academic Achievers. My pleasure. And we're looking forward to hearing more about your career. Thank you. It's awesome. Back to you, Sam. Thank you, Rudy. You also heard from election attorney Howard Grobard, Attorney Ray Marsh chatting with Francesca Mevs. You can watch this program on our YouTube site, youtube.com slash Brooklyn45TV. Please visit our Facebook page, like us, and post your comment about anything you just heard there or on our Snapchat page. On behalf of our Brooklyn45 team, I'm Sam Tate.